why are you excited to be a PA? I'm so excited to be a PA. For me to be able to have such, um, such a large role, an integral role on patient care. Sarah Floyd. I'm going into second year of the Physician Assistant Program at McMaster University and I'm previously a registered massage therapist as well as certified in phlebotomy. Oh, I didn't know about the phlebotomy part. Yeah, awesome. I did that back in 2016. Uh, my company that I worked with before decided to uh, pay for it and I did the schooling over the online Michener uh, program, and then I was able to take their practical component after that, and then I practiced for like a year, and then I wound up in PA school, so oh, didn't good. continue anymore. <laughs> awesome. Um, so can you tell us uh, a little bit about your journey starting from undergrad? Okay, yeah, I'm actually going to pull you back even a little bit further before undergrad because that's when I started the massage therapy. Mm -hmm. So out of high school, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. University kind of intimidated me. Um, so I was really interested in doing something a little bit more hands-on. I went away, did an abroad program first, and when I came back, I decided that's when I was going to apply for the massage therapy program. At the time, the uh, sort of local community programs like Centennial and those things didn't exist so I didn't take the time to look into that. I did a private college. It was the Canadian College of Massage and Hydrotherapy. Very pleased that I did that. I not only learned the basics of massage um, and like the practice of that but I also learned hydrotherapy which has been a great addition. It's more like the water therapy so ice, cold, Epsom salts, um, paraffin waxes, uh, People think maybe a little bit more spa treatment, but has an absolute therapeutic role as well. Um, so following that, I worked about two years and decided that if I didn't go back to school, I probably wouldn't. I was really enjoying massage, but I, I was looking for that further stimulation. Um, and the scope of massage therapy is very different than what it is in medicine, and I, I did crave something a little bit um, broader in terms of the scope of practice. So I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Guelph Humber. I did an honors bachelor of applied science, it's a mouthful, um, in kinesiology. And concurrently I completed a diploma in fitness and health promotion. So essentially it was like personal training. I get the claim to fame of saying that I got to uh, learn how to deadlift in university. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty fun, um, but otherwise, you know, the fitness was great and it's helped me in my extracurricular life, but uh, truly not uh, something that I used for my profession. But I did like the health promotion, so that's where I began to find um, educating patients and at being an advocate for their health and empowering them to improve their own health and, and sort of seize the day is a big part of what inspired me. Fast forward. We uh, get to the company that I worked with that I told you about the phlebotomy. So I had graduated from university at this point. Um, I had done some research with the firefighter health and wellness program because I said that I was so interested in that um, health uh, promotion component of my, my program. And at that point was working in an integrative medicine clinic and um, doing the phlebotomy as well as doing this research. While well, two years in working, um, I decided that that's the time to apply for PA school, so I did. Um, and I applied once, and fortunately I did not get in, so we can talk a little bit about that, since I'm sure there's maybe one or two people who had that experience as well, um, or some people who haven't gotten in who are really looking for that little bit of extra sort of inspiration. Hopefully you can relate to this, because um, it, it is a tough thing to experience, but I did apply again uh, in the second year. And I did get in, and I'm so grateful I have made this decision. People have asked me now that the first year's done what I've really thought about the program. I've had a year to take it in, and that's the one thing I say is I, I'm so happy I made the bold decision to switch careers and go back to school, especially sort of being a little bit older than my peers. It's, it's something that I weighed in on leaving another career that was stable for something that was very unknown and I yeah 
No, no regrets. And can you tell me a little bit about how you heard about the PA profession? Yeah, that was through the health and wellness research project with the firefighters. So it was, we went in and we evaluated not only like the fitness of, the physical fitness of each firefighter, obviously they need to be um, at a certain level to be able to go fight fires and um, still protect themselves while protecting the public. And the idea is um, a physician assistant would come in and do all of the physical exams and make sure that on an occupational level they were prepared to be able to do their job. And so I watched them, I mean, obviously not in the room, but I watched them take each patient in um, and they would complete their health history, their physical exam. And being the one who did all the administrative work, I did see the paperwork and I, I realized how in depth they were going with this medical review and I thought that's something I would really like to be a part of and I would like to provide that level of care not only to people who protect the public but to the public. Mm -hmm. And were you contemplating other careers at the time as well? Absolutely. I think we all sort of go through that. I think that's one of maybe the most relatable things. I, from the most early age, can remember playing Barbies and like um, they were all doctors, so you know everything went through my mind from being a physician to with my background in allied healthcare, especially going into chiropractic or physio, osteo, um, which is osteopathy for people who are not familiar, naturopathic medicine, occupational therapy. You sort of name it. I looked at it. It took a long time. It took a really long time to see what spoke to me and sort of what I resonated with. And to be honest, I didn't want to do anything more allied health. I'd sort of been there, could appreciate it, and could appreciate that I was ready for a change. So it was going to be something in medicine, and when I learned about this wonderful career in the research uh, field, I was like a steam engine, you know, really couldn't hold me back. And what advice would you have for someone that's sort of struggling with, I want to do something in healthcare, but I'm not sure which way to pursue? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I would ask yourself if going to college or university is something you'd like to do. I think choosing a profession based on what it is makes it really difficult. It's one of the biggest things I feel like I have perspective that I can lend to people having done two diplomas and a degree and now doing a second degree. I am a scholar. I love school. I love the hands-on application and I love the research and sort of the more didactic um, learning and the problem-based learning that McMaster also throws at you, of course. Um, but if you don't, university is just not, it's not a fun place otherwise. Um, so I would say ask yourself if you want to learn on more of a hands-on approach and have that as a career because then you should look at what college is sort of offering you versus you want to go a little bit more of that scholarly approach, I would say look at what university is offering you. Um, rather than the profession itself. They're all going to lend themselves to working with people, improving patient care, improving patient outcomes. But at the end of the day, you always ask yourself, you know, what's the thing in that profession that I don't want to do and can I, can I live with it? Because there's always the great. Mm -hmm. And if you can do the thing that you least like doing with a smile on your face, then you'll be happy. My other question for you is, uh, which PA programs did you apply to first round? First round, um, so I put all of my cards in every bucket, so I applied to all three programs in Canada, U of T um, and the consortium, as well as McMaster, as well as the University of Manitoba. Um, obviously, different timelines for each of them and different qualifications. Fortunately for me, I had... Um, the university undergraduate with a GPA that made me a candidate for um, all of the programs as well as any of the course requirements just based on what I had taken and I also have the 900 clinical hours that U of T requires um, having been a massage therapist for eight years um, so I had graduated with a 91.4 percent average from the University of Guelph Humber which had translated, so every university translates sort of differently, which is a 4.0. I can tell you that most people in my program did not have that. And um, when we look back, um, most people are definitely not sitting at the 4.0, so I don't want that to deter anybody by any stretch. 
but um, getting a 4.0 is also possible. So if that's your dream and your goal, then go ahead and try and do that too. What attributes or what habits did you have that helped you obtain a 4.0 GPA while balancing yeah. all these other yeah. extracurriculars and, and things? That's a, that's a great question. This one I have to credit my friends and family and my own personal sort of tenacity, of course. But my friends and family, if I did not have their support throughout this time, I don't think I would have been able to dedicate my own personal like discipline to my endeavors. So my family supported me not only financially, giving me the opportunity to decrease my work hours so that I could actually put the time into studying, um, but I also had a profession where I could take what I was learning and apply it right in real life. So I'd say to a patient, hi, I just learned about this sort of thing and this is what I think might be applicable to you. Let's do some research on that. And now that I have the research skill to actually look at a piece of white paper and a document that's written by experts and assess it for its quality and its validity and, and not only that, but it's um, how much it can actually apply to that patient population, then I can use some of this evidence-based research in my own practice, which unfortunately there wasn't as much um, focus on that in college, and so I can appreciate that on the university level, sort of going back to my previous to point. patients in massage? I asked to my patients in massage. I think I developed my work ethic back in massage therapy school. So when I learned about anatomy, it's all memorization, unfortunately. You literally just have to spend the time and log the hours of memorizing things. And I would draw it on myself. I would draw it on my friends. Oh my gosh, how many friends had permanent marker all over them? Um, just kidding, it was dry erasable. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and I, that carried through to university. So even when I had the extra demands of now working in a career where I had to be present for patients all the time um, and balance that with the demands of school, I knew how to recognize the areas I was weak in, which was not a skill I had in high school, which was what made me very nervous for university, was I could never really understand where I was going wrong. Whereas now, as a more mature learner, as they like to term it, um, it was actually a lot easier to take math and biophysics and those sort of things again, because it was understanding that that's actually where I needed to spend my time and even though I dreaded it and I hated it I would find different ways to reward myself you know and I, I play games that's sort of one of the big things I do with myself I'm a very competitive person um, more competitive with myself than anyone else in fairness but um, you know I'd say if you bring it back to a massage therapy example if you can't remember the names of all three of the hamstring muscles then you have to write it out three times. And it would be a level of that. And so, sure, there's a little bit of a punishment at the end, but there's also a little bit of learning. And when you're a glutton for punishment, it sort of works out. I mean, you work to your strengths, I guess. Mm -hmm. So all schools are wonderful that they respond, but it's not necessarily the response you would hope for. So the University of Manitoba was um, not a win for me, we'll call it. Um, I was a little disappointed that I was not invited to an interview, but that's okay. You're a candidate in some ways for some schools and not in others, and that's, that's really a kind of uh, positive note to take from that experience. So um, I did receive interviews for both U of T and McMaster. I did go to both interviews, and I did not have a really fun time, I'll admit. I thought, what is this MMI business? I had never had to do it. It kind of reminded me of my OSCE, though, from uh, massage therapy, going in from one station to the next to the next. Um, and I'm a little surprised that I wasn't a little bit better on my feet. But what I learned from that whole experience, because unfortunately I did not receive offers of admission, I did receive a wait list for McMaster but it didn't translate into an offer um, at the end of the day. But what I did learn from that was that I needed to come better prepared. And I took it a little bit for granted and I didn't realize how much of an opportunity I sort of blundered and how difficult it was to get these interviews. And it made me shake in my boots for the next year. And I think I just took it so much more seriously the following year. So um, I know it's devastating for a lot 
the students to put in all this work and not hear back. So how did you process those feelings when you got the initial decline? Um, probably like some people, I was very sad. I cried a little, of course. Um, I, I was mad at myself. I was mad at myself for not putting in the time and taking the opportunity seriously. It's unlike me. It's so unlike me. And I heavily debated sharing this, but we talked about what makes us sort of real and relatable. I had just experienced the passing of somebody super important to me the week prior to the first interview, which was U of T. And it was actually across the street at Toronto General Hospital. They weren't a candidate for an organ transplant and honestly passed away within days. It was so hard. And not only was that person close to me, that person was my inspiration for PA school. And they really wanted me to get in that year. And it would have been so sweet, but I just didn't really know how to handle it. And the following year, I promised myself and I promised that person um, who was my professor for four years at university. I actually had him every single year. I chose to have him in my final year to do the research. And he introduced me to the uh, physician assistant profession through um, having the PAs there on site. And he said, I want you to be the head PA for this project one day. And although that may never happen now, um, I think he'd be really, really proud of my perseverance and how far I've come. I stay in contact with his family still. He's got two bright, beautiful young children and a lovely wife. And uh, my partner and I, we stay in contact with them. And it's, it's nice to share my journey with someone who really appreciates how much it's meant. What did you do differently this time around? And did you apply to all three schools again? Good question, big question. Um, after reviewing the requirements for all the programs and honestly my odds of getting in, I decided that I would stay local and only apply to Ontario schools um, as it's where I truly wanted to be as well when taking my education. The things I did differently were prepare, like prepare, prepare, prepare. And what I mean by that was I lived and breathed what I thought was the PA profession because you don't really know until you're in it anyway. But I spent time talking to current PAs who met with me at Starbucks plazas or um, you know near their workplaces and just spent time talking to me about the profession, about the ups and downs, what the unique challenges of the profession have been and how I see some of my skill set blending and marrying with what, what really is required of a PA and my ultimate goals down the line and, and that sort of thing. What I also spent time doing differently was researching some of the CanMed stuff. I spent time researching current Canadian issues. Um, you know, what's, what are our challenges right now here that we face? Um, and then just a little bit more of the basic things. You know, with my background, I'm familiar with the RHPA, which is the Regulated Healthcare Pr um, Practitioners Act, as well as thinking about things like the Constitution. I just wanted to understand what was fundamentally Canadian and what was fundamental about our system here in Ontario and the medicine. Because I think at the end of the day, it's not about how much you know for medicine, maybe. It's who you are as a person and how you can convey that. So if you are educated and you understand a little bit about what's going on in your world, then you can speak to those things. You can be relevant. Um, so you can, you can really showcase your best self. And I think that's really important. And that's what I did the second time around. I, I even spent time preparing as many random questions as I could because that's sometimes how it feels. Um, the questions feel very random. And I would film myself and I would have people sit in a room with me quietly, other physicians or PAs, and they'd ask me the question. I would film myself. I would listen to my response. We'd review it together. They'd give me feedback on it. Um, you know, it's always biased because you never know what, what their people are truly looking for at the end of the day. What I found that I left the interview was a strong feeling, a strong sense of I laid myself out there and if 
I'm happy with that interview and I feel like I presented myself 100%. I laughed, I smiled, I actually had a fun time at the interview. I thought, how could that possibly be? I had such a negative experience the time before and juxtaposed this following year, I was laughing and enjoying myself and halfway through, I like relaxed. And I thought, if that doesn't, if that's not the right candidate, I'm okay with that. It's just sometimes how the world works out. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you say that because um, successful PA candidates that I've talked to often say that they enjoy themselves at the interview. <laughs> um, and I think that you definitely present yourself differently um, when you're relaxed and the interviewers sort of sense that as well, Yeah. as well as patients. <laughs> that's nice to hear. That's yeah. nice to hear. So that's, that's really, really good. PA programs in Canada are very, very competitive. And you're, I would consider you actually a non-traditional candidate. So how would you say that your previous experience helped distinguish you uh, as being a little bit more competitive or a little bit more unique? Um, you know, I read once about a massage therapist who became a PA. Um, only once, of course. It was a U of T graduate, and he was working up north. And I thought, could a second person do that? Like, could, an, like could a second person in allied health, like massage therapy, jump? Because the switch is actually quite large. I thought what I knew from massage therapy school would actually lend to my knowledge in uh, the physician assistant program, but it didn't. It didn't. It did for one section, and I was really surprised by that. You don't realize how specialized your knowledge is until you put it in the broad perspective of learning to be a generalist. I think it helped me for the interview. You know, I'm used to talking to people day in, day out, different people, you know, from all walks of life, from children, often child athletes um, who are coming for massage therapy. But, you know, even when I did phlebotomy for the integrative medicine clinic, you know, we were seeing patients that were sometimes well, sometimes very unwell, sometimes coming from remote areas of the province. Um, I once averaged out my patient population for massage therapy just because I like to do this sort of thing, and it was 43. At the time, I was 20, in my early 20s. It gives me the confidence to be able to talk to people from sort of any context and in any situation, but it's also just, I think, part of my nature. My grandmother would always say, you know, we'd, we'd walk, or pardon me, we'd stand in her elevator and we'd go up all the flights with people, and she'd say something like, oh, don't worry, this girl talks to the wall even, when I talk the ear off of the person who's trapped in the elevator with me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Was it intimidating, this idea of going back to school after having had work experience? Absolutely not, I was so excited. Mm -hmm. You know, I was actually more nervous to go to university the first time, when I was going to my undergraduate degree, having switched from being in college, taking the two years off, and then going to undergrad. But coming to, to the physician assistant program, I was so excited. I was so elated to be in such an elite program with so many like-minded people. I maybe am an outlier in that regard, but I was thrilled. And how do you find uh, getting along with classmates that might be a little bit younger or might not have as much life experience as you? Sometimes it's hard to tell, you know, wh who, who's what age. It, they really are a mature group. I'm very fortunate that everybody has been welcoming and encouraging. There hasn't been any animosity. There's been quite a sense of community, and I think we're all really lucky, and we've, we've fostered that amongst ourselves as a group. You know, it's sometimes easy to get competitive. The physician assistant program at McMaster, anyways, has really, I think, done a commendable job of trying to eliminate that um, and build this sense of aside from community, this knowledge sharing bank um, where everybody wants to come and, and improve not only their knowledge but the knowledge of their peers because you know we're a small profession and as good as you look, as good as the next person looks, you just continue to grow and you grow this profession. How would you describe McMaster's style of teaching in the PA program? I think that was the biggest learning curve for me, you know, it's one thing to have people who are much younger than you in a program who don't have as much life experience with patients, but they offered so much more in that respect. Um, you know, coming up with the ability for like technology and that sort of thing um, has really improved my experience for the problem-based learning. You know, 
accessing things and information is not the same as it used to be. You know, you don't go to the library, you don't look at books and, and come with your handwritten notes from what I've heard about 10 years ago. You know, people come with their laptops and they come with information and it's striking a balance between trying to get enough information that you have a thorough understanding of a concept without getting caught up in all of the details. So it's nice if you have people in your life, like my mom's a respiratory therapist, and so when we started in the respiratory unit, it really helped when she explained blood gases to me. And I didn't really quite get it. It's a quite a confusing uh, concept when you're first starting to understand, you know, whether something's acidotic or alkalotic. And, you know, without going into details, she was able to simplify that for me on a level that I could relate it to all of the other concepts, being those of either disease processes and their, their pathophysiology, as well as how to manage something or evaluate it because I could understand what those terms or those clinical values meant. There's this misconception that studying medicine in PA school is very similar to learning in undergrad. Um, how would you say they're different? I think McMaster definitely makes it different, for me anyways, because juxtaposed to uh, the University of Guelph Humber or just doing any undergraduate degree, it feels like a very passive learning experience. The information is sort of disseminated upon you um, in hopefully the most tangible, applicable way, but really you're relying on somebody who's an expert in your field to give you the information in a series of slides, present it to you, hopefully not too quickly so that um, you, can, you can understand enough of it, and then you take it home and you memorize, and you memorize, and you memorize. You make sure you know all of what's in the slides, and maybe do a little bit of research around it, but honestly not, not very much if you're me. And then you take that and you contrast it with the physician assistant program. It's honestly that knowledge acquisition and how to find it, what's a good resource. So aside from the difference being passive versus active, when we compare and contrast them, the other thing that hits to the core of me is that anything you learn in physician assistant school is fair game in your career. Things that you learn in undergrad, do I use biophysics? Do I know the shear forces going through somebody's spine or the compression at their knee? Can I calculate it with certainty? Absolutely not. There's things that just don't apply in your day-to-day -day life with your undergraduate degree of four years. Are there concepts that I was scared in my boots that I didn't learn in physician assistant school because I know somebody's gonna come in with that issue either in an emergency situation or in the family doctor's office or at a specialist office and it's gonna be upon, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be called upon and have to care for that patient. You can't just breeze over it and go, okay, thanks, you know, I, I got through that exam, I never have to remember that anymore. There's none of that. There's an accountability to actually having to get a con like get a grasp of every single concept so that you can treat every single patient with your due diligence. Um, it's a huge, it's a huge responsibility. And how do you make sure that you stay on top of the information that you're learning in PA <laughs> school? Like, do you have a note-taking system? Do you have bound binders for your MS, folders yeah. in a Dropbox? Yeah. Like, how do you organize yourself? OneNote. I think most people will tell you that. Either OneNote or Microsoft Word. Something on your computer that you have access to. I really don't use much otherwise. You know, there's some loose-leaf papers that you'll get. It's all, it's honestly all there. It's great. I just have different tabs and I pull it up and if I really, really, really want to remember something, I take a picture of it on my phone and then I'll just sort of leave that screenshot attached somewhere on, a, on my computer. Yeah. In your opinion, what kind of person would excel in the style of learning that Mac offers for the PA program? That is a tough question because if you met any of my classmates, their answers would be different. I feel like that anyways, because I feel like all of my classmates are so different, and what works for one of them doesn't necessarily work for me, and I think that's almost the beauty of it. I think with doing whatever works for you and, and feeding off your strengths, I think people don't do themselves enough of a service building off their own strengths.
you know, people are always trying to work on the things that they're not good at. And I think that there's value in that too. But not to forget what you're fantastic at. Use that. Use that to your advantage. Can you give an example? Mm, okay. What do I love? I love anatomy. I'm really good at anatomy. I spent all the time and now it's something that I feel like I can share not only with my learning, um, but I can, and I can help strengthen it, my understanding of different things. So, for instance, when we were trying to palpate different organs on a physical exam, in my brain, I could actually visualize where those were. And with my classmates, I can say, well, where are these ribs? Well, I don't know. And I say, well, this is actually how you count them. This is how you get there. And that sense of tangible learning, which is part of what I know I'm good at, is putting my hands on something, drawing it, feeling it, um, more of that kinesthetic maybe background of learning and, 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 and focusing on that. There's other things. I really like learning by podcasts. So I think there's so many different ones out there. I'm a big fan of the Canadian A. It's hard to say it, but it's easier to spell. I think it's, it's Canadian, but it's not A-N, it's E-H. Yeah, and they're, I find them a great resource. They're not too long. They've got hundreds of them at this point, I think. Um, and I just listen to them in my car. I'm a big commuter. So maybe it's not a strength of mine that I commute, but it's something I do a lot. And I'm good at driving and listening to things at the same time. So I spend a lot of time listening to podcasts, too. So Mac has a program called, or a class called Longitudinal Placements or LPs. Can mm -hmm. you explain what an LP is? Yes. In the brief summary of an LP, it's basically like a one or two day learning experience. It can be done over um, several days, but essentially you come in and it's self-organized by the student. So say I want to organize one in respiratory therapy. So I reach out to my mom and I say, hey mom, is there any respiratory therapist that you know that would be willing to take on a student for a day or two? Um, and like, what's the level of administrative work required behind that? And usually they get it set up quite easily because generally facilities are wonderful with learners and they want to be able to help all of the learners that are one day going to be working in the profession. Um, so I think they do their best you know, to the best of their ability, given the volume that they experience for learners. Um, and then you go ahead and you set those up. For McMaster, you require four LPs, um, longitudinal placements. And I mean, it's, I make it sound very breezy, but it isn't necessarily always that easy to get them. It's easier if you have contacts, but say you're coming into PA school and all of your family knows business or law, and that's not an area that, you know, you have contacts in it. It can make it a little bit more challenging, but they're, are sort of um, data banks that the program provides you that you know there's there's preceptors that are willing to take you on you know I know other people in the profession that are currently working as physician assistants are generally quite open to taking uh, students as well so gracious of them because you know everyone needs to get that start somewhere and it was something I always loved doing for massage even if people wanted to come in and ask me a few questions I didn't know them they were looking at the program and I thought you know it's a little bit of altruism in terms of helping your community and doing something that you don't necessarily gain a whole bunch of benefit for so the longitudinal placements are a great opportunity for students but I think students also need need they must show their gratitude and their respect for having the opportunity as well. I've had some pretty wonderful opportunities and saying thank you goes a long way to not only being invited back, but maybe having a job someplace someday. And what advice would you give to incoming students about getting the most out of an LP? Do your research. If you don't know about um, an industry or an area going into it, don't just put it on that um, teacher for you to then learn those concepts. Come prepared knowing what you want to learn, maybe what are some of the common things that you might see there. Um, even if it's a specialty and you have no idea what that person, you know, the four specific procedures they do, have an idea of what that specialty entails. What it maybe a day would be in like that and, and just what you want to learn um, as a physician assistant and take away from that experience. 
the one that I feel I prepared the most for, you know, I feel like I got the most out of. So mm -hmm. you get in, you get out of it what you put in. And what's the expected um, mannerisms or behavior of an LP student on an LP? Like, are you just a wallflower in the background? <laughs> do you have like a little notebook where you're writing questions? Yeah. Do you just follow the PA wherever they go and then ask questions between patients? Yeah. How should they show up? How should they dress? Um, what can they expect? Good question. Because in um, the famous words of Sahand, it depends. <laughs> It depends because every institution and every placement is different. So ask, just ask, that's all I do. You know, sometimes, um, you know, when I was going into surgery and I, I didn't know whether I was supposed to wear scrubs from that institution or bring my own, or whether, you know, because we were on clinical rounds that day, was I still supposed to be in scrubs or was I supposed to wear business casual? Um, you know, the surgeon just forwarded me to his administrative assistant and she was able to be such a valuable resource in some of those more of more um, sort of day-to-day -day tasks, right? They're not the specific surgical tasks that you're necessarily gonna um, ask that person, but they can be so helpful in, in giving you background information. So use them as a resource for some of your um, more administrative questions like parking and what to wear, where to show up, who to talk to to get your badge, that sort of thing, absolutely. Um, when it comes to doing procedures or being, you know, partaking in anything, it really is up to the institution uh, and their, their policy. So some places I was able to get in, grab my stethoscope and listen to different, you know, heart murmurs at, uh, you know, one hospital, whereas in another hospital it was absolutely no touching, like, there's got to be this much between you and the patient. No, I'm kidding, but it felt like you know, I needed to have like this buffer zone so that I didn't get too close so that I wouldn't risk touching the patient. Because um, you want to be respectful, right? Again, this is an opportunity that they're extending to you. Patients are in extremely vulnerable situations sometimes and you just want to be as respectful as you can um, with, with everything that you do. Again, all of these, not only are you representing your school, yourself, your profession, um, but maybe you might get a job one day. And we all, as students, are always thinking about that next step of getting a job. Um, just for those that aren't familiar with the PA program at Mac, mm -hmm. uh, what is clerkship? Right, clerkship, so all the schools use their own funny words, but essentially clerkship is your year of rotations where you do core placements in things like family medicine, emergency medicine, surgery. They're generally four to six weeks, um, and then there's also two electives. Choose your own adventure. At U of T, the uh, clerkship rotations are northern and southern Ontario. Yes. Where are generally the locations for rotations with the McMaster PA program? A lot of them are in the Hamilton and the Hamilton greater area. So uh, Stony Creek, St. Catharines, Burlington, Oakville, uh, those sort of areas. But they have some pretty far reach. I mean, some of my classmates are in Delhi and Kitchener and Guelph those areas um, and then some are in Toronto less are in Toronto but you know if you want to set up an elective or there's some core emergency medicine rotations in Toronto um, the big teaching hospitals with the clinical teaching unit so we have access to some of those which is really exciting because I want to be in Toronto because I'm a local Torontonian. Mm -hmm. And is there the option to do rural out of province or international electives? Absolutely uh, you have to sign up through ROMP um, so the school will help you do that. It's uh, to do rural placements. There is uh, definitely incentives and benefits to doing a rural placement. I have some interest in it. I've learned through doing the PA program. I'm so sad to admit this. I, I actually get quite homesick. So I thought it was something I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to bring access to rural um, places. But unless I like uproot my family, it's going to be so hard. Um, so... Maybe a little bit up there for a few weeks, I can totally handle, but um, again, I think we should just commend all the people who are willing to be um, up north. You know, obviously there's people who love it, who were raised there and born there, um, and, and kudos to U of T's program for really pushing that. Uh, you know, all the programs are so unique, and each of them have such great benefits, and I think that's one of U, U of T's, and we should definitely highlight that. What are you looking forward to in second year? Ooh, 
doing all the procedures. Um, yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to paperwork, actually. No, of course not. Who's looking forward to paperwork and charting and all of those things? Um, actually, there's probably some, some enjoyment I will get out of that. I, I do like those sort of tasks. But I think I really, really, really want to intubate a patient. I've heard so much about it from my mom. I've talked shop with her for 15 years. And now having practiced it on our clerkship transition day on some of the... Um, the mannequins like it's just been something that I'm so excited about doing so anything sort of procedural doing um, a physical exams with the patients you know I'm I'm a little bit more comfortable with the IVs the phlebotomy you know drawing blood giving intramuscular injections performing ECGs ultrasounds um, I did carotid ultrasounds as well for my other job so I feel like those sort of things I'm going to be a little bit less excited to do because it'll be um, not as much of a novelty, but something that's newer that I haven't done before, probably even just putting oxygen on a patient, it will get me excited initially. And now that you've finished uh, first year PA and you're about to go into second year, how has your understanding of what a PA is or the definition <laughs> changed from being a pre-PA to actually having gone through the program? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's funny because they said you don't really know what it is like, until you're in it sort of like join this club um but I you know I was thinking about it as we were going through the interview and I was like is that true is that really true because our program at the beginning the very first day of PA school they gave us a sheet of paper and they said write the definition of what you would say to somebody is a PA and on the last second last week of PA school they handed it back and said what do you think about your uh, definition? What would you change? What would you add? And I, I looked at mine and I went, that's pretty good. That's pretty accurate. And I was thinking to myself, I don't remember what I wrote before I got it back, right? Before I got the piece of paper back, I was thinking, oh my goodness, I have no idea what I wrote. It probably sounds preposterous. I'm sure it's not accurate, but it is. It was very verbose. I mean, I like words. I talk a lot. So I write as I talk. And what I've learned now is that being short and sweet and making it a little bit more concise and clear is very fundamental. A physician assistant is a, an integral member of a healthcare team. They provide direct primary patient care um, and they do things like health histories, physical exams, they order and interpret different tests like blood tests and different investigations like an x-ray um, and they follow patient's management. So whether that's over the short term in the emergency room or over the long term in a family doctor's office, uh, there'll be somebody who extends the care of the physician and the whole medical team. You've decided to share your journey uh, as a PA student on Instagram. So yeah. what inspired you to start that? You know, I'm, I'm a person who likes to share. It's good for me. I have the opportunity to share my experience. It's sort of cathartic. It's reflective. Um, and, and I get to look back and say, look how far I've come every single time. You, you really want a sense of community in this profession. So it's nice to be able to reach out to other people who are doing the same thing and who want to share as much as you do. You know, it feels like sometimes you're being put on display and you're, you're quite nervous about sharing things. You know, how do I caption this? Or, and they seem very vain at the time. But the, the feedback that I received um, has been nothing but positive and people love to spark up conversations or talk to me about it. And I've had people just in, like sort of message me of their own volition and ask me about the program and my experiences and it's been it's been very rewarding you know you asked me maybe what the difference was between being younger versus older in the program and what that's been like I think I really want to share how do you balance <laughs> capturing like the experience of being a PA student while also you know putting your best foot forward respecting patient privacy like how do you yeah how do you uh, toe that line I personally separated myself um, because that's what I was comfortable with. So I have a personal account that I have for my home life and my personal life, um, but I also have a professional account, which is open and public. Um, the other one's private. Um, so it's open and public, and 
I am meticulous about what I share on there. I edit it, I sit on it for half a day sometimes, and I don't post it um, because I am extremely aware of the consequences, good or bad, that can come with having an online presence. It not only is a huge responsibility for you to present yourself accordingly, because like I said, you can build community, which also builds you a reputation, good or bad, and it will follow you. It is a small community. Um, but you're also representing you know, your school or um, another institution. You know, A lot of the things we do are through the Children's Hospital, the McMaster University Children's Hospital. And um, you know, if I tag something that's on, you know, that we did on their premises, I wanna make sure that that's something I'm allowed to do in the first place so that you know nobody feels like I'm overstepping and I don't feel you know I don't feel bad if if that were to happen you know I don't I don't ever want to be in a position where somebody is saying to me you shouldn't have done that that wasn't respectful you crossed the line you know if if it ever did happen I would hope somebody would say something to me so that I could rectify that but you know having been as meticulous and conservative about what I do post has, I think, benefited me. Um, so what I like about our school and our program is that they try to make everything as sort of applicable as possible. So they pulled different like articles and um, had, you know, various platforms available for us to sort of talk about and um, talk about how we currently interact with them. I had sort of talked about some of the things that I said um, here with you now. And some of the things I think they wanted for us to take away were if you think you shouldn't post it, don't post it. Just don't do it, don't risk it. Don't risk it for yourself. Image you wanna provide on social media, that's sort of the thing the program wanted us to take away from it. We, you know, we worry about being cautious about everything that we put on there, that you, know, you don't wanna almost be so robotic about it and not be relatable. So there's also that benefit of social media in that you get to be you, you have full control over it, it's, you know, you get the final say, you are the, you know, writer, the editor, the publisher, you have full, full control. So that's nice um, that the program showed us how much, um, you know, how, how empowered we can be with that experience and how many apps, like you were talking about, the figure one is available to be able to use those. We don't currently use them yet just because uh, we're not in that phase, but I'm sure it'll be coming very soon with this transition. Um, you know, anything else that they really wanted us to learn was other than be careful, other than, um, you know, present yourself as you'd like to be seen on your best day, not on your worst day, and and take advantages of the unique opportunities that social media has to offer you. I feel like those are probably the best, the, the pillars of that lecture. Why are you excited to be a PA? I'm so excited to be a PA for the scope. The scope of practice is so different and it's so big in comparison to what I've been used to in the past. Um, before, I was limited to not diagnosing or prescribing, and so that's just a completely new avenue for me to be able to have such, um, such a large role, an integral role on patient care. Yeah. And um, what impact do you see PAs having on healthcare? There's sort of a unified sense of what PAs bring to the table, but also what each individual brings in their context-specific or job-specific role. You know, what somebody's going to bring in their specialty is going to be very different from what somebody maybe on like the researcher, administrative, or advocate level that somebody else is going to bring versus long-term primary care. Um, so if I were to make a general sort of statement or consensus about what I think PAs bring to the table, patient care, good quality patient care, and a dedication to improving Canadian health standards. I think that that's something a lot of professions want to do, but PAs are doing a really good job of, is improving that bar and setting that bar a little bit higher every single time. So once they attain that bar, they just want to keep pushing that bar a little bit more. And it's a very respectable thing to do in a day and age 
where resources are so strained and time is so strained. I'm excited to be able to do that because I think having that level and quality of care will impact people on a personal level. You know, it's, it's all about those individuals rather than a whole system that we keep talking about. Like, we're talking about people. And if you can make somebody's care better, if you can improve their outcomes per person, then on a system level, you will improve the population. My dream is population level care. You know, I said I was interested in, um, you know, the health promotion. I'm interested in direct patient care. But what I think that translates to over time and what I hope to work in one day is public health policy. And if you can change things on an individual level and understand what the people need, then you can be an advocate for the people. You know, I'm not quite ready to make that change yet. I thought, you know, when you asked me about what I was looking into, I even looked into a master's of public health because it is something that I value. It is something that's so important to me um, down the line. You know, maybe I will be a politician or something that's in the health, you know, more in the health vein, if you will. Um, you know, I, I used to, this is a way back, play back, but I used to work for Lululemon um, Athletica, the you know real health company, and they used to say, "What's your BHAG? Your big, hairy, audacious goal?" And I said, "I'm going to be the minister of health one day." Even if you don't become the minister of health one day, it's okay because you're going to strive for the moon, and you will reach somewhere beautiful in the stars, right? Like the idea is, hopefully, I can understand what we need, not only as a city, as a province, but hopefully as a nation, so that I can create health policies that will one day protect and serve today's population, but hopefully our generations to come. You are a PA bride-to-be. Yes. Uh, when did you get engaged, and do you have a wedding date set? Yes. I got engaged on the very surprising but romantic day of Christmas last year. So it was December 25th of 2018. Um, it was a little bit of a surprise. It was a cute little scavenger hunt, and then he popped the question. We cried. It was, it was great. Um, and, you know, you're not really sure what to expect because you've never been through this process before, but I will tell anyone who is either getting engaged or who's thinking about getting engaged, the next question that everybody asks you afterwards, when's the date? Where, where, where are you guys getting married is the one that follows that one. So we set our date for September 25th, 2020. I will be finished my clerkship. I will be finished PA school at that time prior to the big board exam. What have you been able to plan since getting engaged? Not much. <laughs> um, so I planned the venue. I, it's important, you gotta pick what's most important to you. Not everything in your wedding can be important. So for me, the venue is the most important. I wanted something outdoors and I looked at about 12 different places. It was excessive. Um, but, you know, for me, I justified that by saying, well, this is probably gonna be the most expensive part of the purchase, so I gotta love it, and it's the most important part to me, so I gotta love it. Um, so I spent a lot of time doing that, and subsequently, I have spent time you know, figuring out what my game plan is really. And once I figured out that, I was able to then subdivide those into smaller tasks. You know, looking at the whole big um, task is daunting, as you probably know. <laughs> Absolutely. It's almost like project management. Yeah. And, um, all these subtasks, deadlines, following through. <laughs> It's funny you say it like that only because I was thinking to myself, man, can I put this on my resume? Like we're planning events that are in the, you know, tens of thousands of dollars here. This is the first time I, I thought about it. I was like, why is this so much work? Why do I feel like this is? And then I thought, wow, this is what event planning is like. This is truly why people get paid to do this because it is, not only is it hard work, it, it takes some experience. So I learned my lesson actually. I've been doing my research. So I've been watching podcasts on how to plan a wedding, how to keep your expenses managed. So I've, I've been putting that work up, up front and then finding my, finding my people, my resources. So the people that will help you, who will say, I'll be there when I, you know, you need to paint that decoration or you need to go, you know, try on dresses. So I've got a little list of people who, um, who said that they wanted to help and I can just give them a call when I need them for 
you know, various tasks. Being a PA bride to be is that you're sort of amplified in everything. You know, your timing is a little bit more congested. You know, you have you have to balance school and your placements and what you know your physicians want of you with you know, going to taste that beautiful cake. Not the worst thing in the world to do, but all of these planning and, you know, little things to do. You know, the PA program's already compressed and to, you know, try and fit another thing in that takes so much time out of you. And something I actually want to spend time doing. I, I really enjoy the idea of planning this event. You know, some people might not. And I don't want to miss out on enjoying it just because it flew by because I was trying to do so many other things at the same time. I think that's going to be my personal biggest challenge. The other unique amplification is uh, the finances. I think, you know, that can't go without saying modern day weddings are expensive. It's hard to get around that. You know, venues are expensive, food's expensive, flowers are expensive. Um, and when you're in a two-year program straight for 24 months, uh, you have absolutely no time to work. And there's no summers, there's no, there's, there's just no free time. And even doing massage therapy is not an option. I, I stopped, I, I stopped back in January of this year um, and left the profession uh, as an active member anyways. And I really jumped two feet into being in this program. But then I got engaged and I was like, I could do two things at once, right? Right? That makes me human. Um, any uh, tips for brides-to-be? Honestly, I think the biggest thing that I have figured out in planning this event is talking to my partner. Just communicating and being clear because, I mean, this is one of the first big things you'll do as, you know, a married couple together is have this wonderful celebration. And my partner, as long as he says, does it make you happy? Is it within budget? Sounds great. You know, for some people that's not enough direction. For me, that's great because I have a whole vision in my mind. The tips I would give a bride, other than communicating with your partner anyways, would be setting up your budget. That's a probably number one thing because um, it really determines what you can do and then your guest list. Like, if you know how many people you see having at your wedding, it really changes not only the venues, but your budget, that sort of thing. So you kind of have to work those things in together. Um, and just like anything else, there's kind of never a good time to get married. There's, you're always going to have things in life. So pick a time that makes you happy. Not everybody's going to come. Not everybody's going to be able to make it. You know, that's, that's the reality of party, um, like planning any event, let alone a wedding, just any party. Um, so do it when you want to, when it makes you happy. And the biggest piece of advice I've been given is, especially right on that day, let it go. You know, you've planned, you've planned everything up until that day. Everything on that day is out of your control. So just go with it, roll with every single punch, because you'll have a beautiful day no matter what. I just wanted to thank you, Anne, for having me. It's been a privilege and an honor, and I appreciate everything that you do for our community and everything that you've done for me, even in my first year so far. Awesome. Thank you. Thank I really you. appreciate that.